Welcome to episode 29 of the Going For Broke Outdoors podcast, a podcast by an outdoorsman for other outdoorsmen. I'm your host, Jeremy Gillespie. On today's podcast, I talk with my good buddy, Joel Moss. Joel and I met 10 years ago during a new employee orientation. We started talking about hunting and the rest is history. Now, 10 years and seven or eight out-of-state hunting trips later, Joel and I discuss some of our biggest mistakes and lessons learned that have helped us to become more proficient and efficient traveling hunters. Guys, at the time I'm recording this, I only need 83 more listeners on YouTube to subscribe to this podcast to reach 1,000, which has been a goal of mine for a while. If you haven't already subscribed and you enjoy this podcast, please subscribe and turn on the bell icon to be notified every time I release new content. Before we jump into today's episode, I want to give a shout out to Uncle Lou at Stealth Outdoors for helping to make this podcast possible. Check out Stealth Outdoors at www.stealthoutdoors.com. Get a jump start on gear preparation for the 2023 season with the products from Stealth Outdoors. Designed from the ground up with a mobile hunter in mind, Stealth Outdoors manufactures climbing stick wraps, cam buckle covers, platform cable wraps, and stealth strip rolls for all of your miscellaneous silencing needs. Stealth your mobile hunting setup this off season by visiting www.stealthoutdoors.com to silence your gear and to place an order today. Now, on to the podcast. Joel, for people that don't know you already, give me a little bit of background. Where are you from? How'd you get into hunting? All right. I'm from uh, from Southeast Michigan. I got into hunting. Basically, my my family always always hunted. They owned some land farmed north of here, and everybody always hunted. I, I didn't get a chance to go too much when I was younger. I was playing hockey, and that takes up a lot of your time in the fall, so I was doing that. But my grandpa had got me into fishing and shooting squirrels and stuff like that i loved it and i always loved hearing about everybody that was going up deer hunting and and stuff so i i started going a little bit and then started getting a little bit more time and when i got done playing hockey i started taking it more seriously and started going a little bit more and they started as you know your typical michigan hunter going up just gun hunting during the gun season and slowly kind of got into Went to archery hunt, got a bow, started shooting, started going bow hunting and going with buddies and family members and kind of got, got into about when, when you and I met, getting more serious about it, wanting to learn how to shoot better deer or at least just see more bucks regularly. There's so many deer in Michigan and you see 20 dollars a night. So I just wanted to learn what, what the bucks were doing and maybe what some better bucks were doing and it just escalated from there. Yeah. So that's what I want to talk about today is kind of progression from getting started in hunting to taking it more seriously. And then something that we've been doing for almost 10 years now is traveling to hunt. So you mentioned in there, started taking a little more serious about the time that we met. That was also the time that I was getting a little more serious about archery hunting. So Joel and I for background, met in November of 2012. We both got hired for the same job and had to go through some training together, started talking. And then I think we were the only people that liked to hunt in there. So naturally we started talking to each other kind of about our backgrounds and what our goals were at the time. I hadn't shot many good bucks at all, but I was starting to understand the concept. I'd been reading the John Eberhardt books. And I think I have to look back actually, I think I didn't join the hunting beast until the following year until the 13 and then we started talking about that a lot but I had just bought my first lone wolf setup so I actually bought that prior to getting on the hunting beast forum and I was starting to move around a little more and from reading the Eberhart books about moving different sets all the time I didn't have a saddle and I didn't want to buy 50 tree stands so I bought a, a lone wolf and that's kind of how that started so Joel let's uh let's flash back to 2012 what were you doing at that time as far as your archery hunting that you look back on now and you kind of laugh like what were some of the mistakes you were making at that time as a newer archery hunter probably all the mistakes right you just sit spots too much not moving around enough then then it kind of went from realizing hey, i'm sit, sitting in the same spots and educating the deer and not seeing what i want to see to moving around way too much and spreading myself way too thin and you start hearing about all the uh, importance of first time sets and you got to hone, I think you got to hone in on your areas and learn your areas more before you start bouncing around. So I was just bouncing around sitting all over the place, different spots, but that was wrong too. So it went from almost one, one extreme to the, to the next. I'd say I was 
your typical Michigan hunter. You're hunting on smaller properties, and you got a million people stacked up on you, like condos hunting. So everybody's doing doing the same stuff. You got to do do stuff differently than than other people. I'm gonna pick on you here. One of the things that I remember, and I think this is probably a situation that a lot of guys that listen to this podcast can relate to, is you had two very young kids at the time, and you didn't have time to get out and scout as much as you'd like. I know that for a fact just from talking to you back then, but that's reality for a lot of people. And that was reality for you. So you were, were relying a lot on cyber scouting. And so talk to me about the evolution of picking a spot off a map and how often that actually works out versus what we do now. It's cyber scouting is kind of step one and then you get into the boots on the ground and then kind of tweak an area. So maybe talk about the evolution of that process a little bit. Sure. I think cyber scouting just strictly cyber scouting probably works for me exactly one time. Other other than that, like when we when we took our first trip and we went to Ohio, that was what the whole thing was. And I think I was pretty confident because maybe it was the year before that or I don't know, it was really recent to that where I'd pick pick the spot, went, hung a lone wolf and sat there and shot my best buck and thought, All right, you can just pick these spots and go in there and kill great bucks. And we we went to Ohio, and that was all we, all we had. We had no boots on the ground, no knowledge of the area or anything, and we're on Cal Topo at the time. And I remember even sitting at work on breaks, and we were messaging each other and stuff. And what were we doing on Cal Topo? Shading like the top top third, and I thought we had it licked. We were going to go down there, and we had a million spots picked out for every wind, and. Surely each one of them was going to have a buck in it, but you get humbled pretty quick and you learn there's, there's really no, no replacement for the experience and getting boots on the ground and learning the areas and figuring out where the deer are at and what they're doing. Cyber scouting is a good, good starting point, I think, to maybe start and go out and start scouting and picking areas apart. But as far as picking a spot on a map, going in, hanging a stand and being right in the game more often than not, that's, that's not, that's not going to kill you a buck. Yeah. There's just too many variables. And for reference, what we do now, I still cyber scout and I know you do too. Anytime we're going to a completely new area, but then I think the big difference now is that we'll look at that as kind of the first year paying dues. And then we're going to go to that area, unless it's a total bust, we're going to go to that area two, three, four years. We'll use Kansas as an example. We went two different si- two different times off season just for scouting in like March or April, do some shed hunting, really pick those areas apart when the sign's still there before all the regrowth starts and there's no one in there and you're not messing the deer up. And then something that we've started doing more recently, I'd say the last three, maybe four years, well, we did in South Dakota for sure, so four, maybe even five years, I don't know. It's been a minute, but is... So we cyber scout, we make a preseason trip to scout boots on the ground if we can. And then the first day or two, we get to a new area, even during the rut, we spend driving around, seeing what the food sources are, trying to find dough pockets, seeing what's going on locally because the crop rotation and stuff that can change every year and, and the deer aren't always in the same spot. And that's something I know we were, we were definitely both missing early on. That's made a big difference. Oh, Absolutely. Absolutely. And with, with the cyber scouting too, you mentioned we're, we're still doing it now, but after getting some experience and hunting and boots on the ground and shooting some deer and seeing where they're at and with the cyber scouting now, you kind of are relating that to trends that you've, you've seen already. So it makes it, makes it a little, a little bit more effective too. Yeah. So let's go back to that Ohio trip. That was, I can't remember if that was my first, but I think that was my second trip out of state ever. And I can't remember. Do you know, was that 2013 or 2014? There was one of them too. Yeah. So I, yeah, it was around that time. I'd went to Kentucky the year before and that didn't work out very well (laughs) either. So again, still very green, but we went that year and we talked about some of the mistakes we made only relying on cyber scouting, but there's a lot more that goes into a trip like, just logistics and I think we've learned a lot about that too as far as being prepared with the right kind of gear lodging all that stuff so maybe talk about some of that stuff what do you what changes do you think we've made since then 
that makes us more prepared for everything besides Don, as far as coolers, clothing, uh, places to stay, all that. Oh, God. I, well, I think we've come a long way. I think that the first trip that we took, I don't even know if we took a cooler. I took a, a like a sheet, I think, and a pillow in a tent, and I froze my ass off because I, I don't know. It didn't even occur to me that I'm, I need a good sleeping bag or, you, you know, because when, when did we go? We went. Uh, End of October. Yeah, it was more middle of October, I thought. It, we we didn't time it right either because that was kind of around. My kids were young, and I couldn't make it happen around the good good time, but I don't know. So we went from that, right? Like, I don't think we took coolers. I don't think we had any preparation for if we kill a deer like i said i took i took a sheet that was freezing just stupid you learn what clothes to take what's going to keep you on stand longer you shoot a deer you know then we we end up buying better and bigger coolers and taking vacuum packers and bags and knives gambrel gambrel cutting board you know uh we got the deal to hang them off your off your tailgate so you can Caught them up there. I had sprint service on my cell phone. We learned was terrible. The first trip, I, I didn't even have a, a signal. You had Verizon at that point. So I, I remember I was kind of relying on, on your phone. So, you know, I ended up switching to Verizon. That was one thing. So I, I knew I had a better signal wherever it was that I'd be hunting to navigate in and out and start taking two bows on trips just, just in case something happens and archery tools and, just being a hundred percent prepared for everything that you could, you could think of without taking the entire kitchen sink, but being prepared, just being overly prepared for the hunting, the lodging, eating, we're taking food too. That's another thing that we do, Jeremy. We, well, each one of us will prep a meal and we got probably four, four dinners out of it and take some freeze dried meals and the jet boils. And we're trying to do it as, as cheap as we can too. So. Just being being prepared and trying to do it on somewhat of a budget and make sure we have all of our amenities and, you know, we're just trying to cover all of our bases. And I know a lot of the stuff is mistakes that we've made, and that's a big reason why I'm bringing this stuff on, on this particular podcast. So if you're someone that's newer to traveling out of state or thinking about taking your first out of state hunt, I'd recommend listening to that section again because we thought we were prepared that first year. Like Joel said, we thought we had it licked. We had all these spots picked out and we thought we had all the gear. And then we got there and we learned we were woefully underprepared and we didn't have the experience we needed to, to have a successful hunt. But over time, hopefully by, by listening to things like this or reading articles, you can shortcut that process. So that's the goal. And I think that's the goal, like the hunting beast forum and the podcast is help guys shorten the learning curve. But there's, I say it all time. There's no replacement for experience. So you got to get out there and get your hands dirty. And, and I would say, and you'd probably agree too, if guys are out there and they haven't hunted out of state or they're thinking about it, just do it because you're going to learn so much the first time. It doesn't need to be perfect. Just get out there and start learning. Yeah, you are. You're going to learn so much. You're going to learn what, what the animals are doing and where they're at and what type of terrain they're, they're using. and what Because it's not going to be like, or probably not going to be like what your, your home area is going to be. And it's out of your comfort zone. You're not you're not at your house where you've got all your stuff, and you know you're taking everything that you need. You're on the road. You're on the fly. Different areas, different trains. You're gonna you're gonna learn a lot. You just got to be be able to learn what what you what you need to do. So don't just keep doing everything that you're doing on the first trip. Just learn what was going good for you. Learn what you need to change and adapt. And it's only gonna get better. So you actually made one more trip to Ohio with uh, another friend of yours that I didn't go on. And that one, I think, from what I recall, was equally disastrous to our first trip. So talk about that a little bit. I, I feel like you did some things better there, but but still we're having issues. So how'd that trip go? That that trip went, went terrible, too. But, but a little bit better. I did realize that I need to get more boots on the ground, not just going to a spot and hang the lone wolf and you're going to kill something because you're not. So that trip, that, that was, I think what I, what I really learned there was that that area is garbage. I spent so much time scouting. One, the big takeaway was these were short trips that we first started taking too. When there's not deer everywhere and you got to find them, if it's not just a 
target rich environment. When I said that area was garbage, it, I'm sure there's good bucks there, but they're just not everywhere. It's going to take some time to find them. And I think I only went for four or five days and I walked most of that time and spent maybe a day and a half hunting and I saw a deer and see good deer. That first trip that you and I were on too, that was also a short one. So that I think that was my big takeaway off those trips was you need to give yourself, I think we, we like to give ourselves at least 10 days when we're going on these trips, right? Yeah. So you need time to find the deer, you, then time to hunt them. So you don't want to waste your time and just start sitting stands when when you don't have confirmation that there's deer there. So that's that's really our program is we're going, scouting, finding the deer and then then hunting right yeah and i think that's a great point on the length of the trip and i would say earlier on while you're hunting where you're learning areas out of state or you're new to out of state hunting in general it's more important then to have the longer trips because i think once you get three four five years invested in a state or an area or whatever then you've kind of got it figured out and longer is always better that's always going to up your odds but if you had to go to Kansas now uh, that we've been three years with only four or five days, I feel like we'd both be way more confident in our chances of getting it done than we would have been the first year where you're figuring so much of that stuff out the first year or two. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, that, that's true. So I wouldn't short yourself if you're new um, and it's your first trip. Take some time, 10 to 14 days probably, and – Go find the deer and figure out what's going on. Where you're, you're right. If we went now to an area that we know four or five days, you're probably going to get into some animals, I would think. But yeah, you need a basis, though. You need a jump off point. Yeah, it goes back to spreading yourself too thin, too. And and I've been guilty of this in the past, too. A lot of these guys that are experienced top level hunters, you see them on the internet or the forums. These guys are killing three, four, five bucks a year, and that's possible, but. In your first year, if I only had, let's say I had 10 days only of vacation all year to hunt, I would much rather spend that in one good area than I would three, three or four day trips. Wouldn't you agree? Agreed. Yeah. Thousand, thousand percent. Yeah. So yep. if I was on like a five year plan, my plan would be to hunt maybe two states or let's say six years, two states. And I would hunt them both three years each before I even thought about adding anything else. Cause it takes time to learn these areas. Like I said, it's a lot of times it's different than your home environment and the train and all that stuff. So a little bit different strategies, timing's a little different. Some of the ruts uh, out west are a little later than they are, like than in Wisconsin and Michigan. So all that stuff takes time to figure out. And if you have these real short windows, it's tough to, to put the learning or put the time in to get the learning. Yep, exactly. You, you need the learning before then. I think a lot of those guys, they, you, there's not enough time in the fall to take, you know, four two week trips really for most people. So a lot of the guys that are shooting all these bucks and taking trips and doing it in short windows, they've, uh, they've spent the time and paid their dues and, and learned these areas. I don't think they're going to multiple new areas a year and shooting good deer and short, short windows like that. They, they know the areas or, or even, even a network, right? Like you start, start getting, it's like work as, as you get more into it, you start getting, a better network and, and that helps too. You know, then then you can have buddies that hey, they've they've been here, they live there or whatever and that that shortens the learning curve too. Yeah, the another thing is after I don't know what the number of years is, I'm sure it depends in, by each individual hunter, but after five, six, seven, eight years of traveling and hunting a few different straits a few different states, a few different types of terrains you do get better overall. Like you said, like you start, you start relating things back that you've seen in person to your cyber scouting and you get more of the sixth sense. Uh, Dan talks about a lot. You got to have confidence, but it, he also talks about it's kind of a double-edged sword because how do you get confidence if you're not killing anything? So it's weird. You just got to put in the time. And when you do start killing some deer and you can start relating that back in different states, when you go to a new state for the first time, you're farther up the curve. You still got to put that work in, but it, it feels like it takes a little less time every time we do that now. It does. Yeah. And, and you do, you got to put, put the time in and, and start figuring things out. And you're right. Once you see something someplace, then it, 
it could relate to to another place, you know, maybe just like like pressure. We've never been to Wisconsin to hunt yet, but just from what we've seen on forums and stuff and hearing from people that's a little bit more higher pressure, so you gotta be more aggressive and probably get tighter to betting, whereas if we're going to a, a state where there's not as much pressure, let's say an early season hunt, you're probably going to, let's say we're going to Wisconsin and we're going to hunt in a swamp or whatever. We're probably going to want to get tight, real tight to batting with a hundred yards or so. So you're going to plan accordingly to where like we were just in Montana early season and I wasn't sitting tight to, to batting. I was probably 250, 300 yards away from where I thought, but just where they'd be batting right. Cause then we'd know less pressure. They're going to move more. You just start, and I'm sure that would be relatable to an, to another state with less less pressure, so, stuff like that. You see trends and learn what you would need to do in in those situations. Yeah, and again, it's all putting in the time and a learning process. So I want to bring up another example. Again, I don't remember if it was 2013 or 2014. We went to Ohio, but 2019 we did not draw Kansas, so we've been drawn about every other year. So at that time, you could still buy, they've changed it now, but you could still buy an archery tag, I think up till August. So we bought archery tags for South Dakota. And the cool thing about South Dakota is now you have to buy them by April 1st, but the tag's good for mule deer or whitetail. I think along with that change, we got to buy them by April 1st. You can hunt private land starting September 1st. They've got a September 1st opener, but you can only hunt public land October 1st and later. But we wanted to do a rut hunt anyways, so we, we bought that tag, and we had never been there. We did do cyber scouting, but we weren't able to make a preseason trip, which we would have preferred to do, but we just we didn't have the time or the money or both. But we got there, and I'd like you to kind of compare and contrast the experience of the first time in Ohio, which we both admit was a disaster, to the first time in South Dakota. I feel like we had a way better idea. So what was your experience like there? Let's talk about that a little bit. You're right. We we were just way more prepared. We'd done some trips already at that point and uh, knew what to ex- what to expect. At that point, we we killed some deer out of state. At that point, and I, th- I think you had it more figured out than me because you, you'd already killed a, a big buck before I even got there. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, just as far as what what we were bringing with us and and how how we were going about it. We brought a boat that trip. We, that didn't work out too well for whatever reasons. But, I mean, we were just more prepared to tackle any any scenario, more open-minded. We weren't glued to tree stands. That that, that trip, we were, I don't, we, I, we sat, in, I sat in a stand one time in however long we were there, 10, 10 days or so, yeah. Um, we were just moving around and using the terrain and, I learned a lot there from, well, from you too, because you had already been in Montana at that point and hunting on the ground and using the terrain and moving around and staying in the shadows and not getting, not getting silhouetted and just, we, we got into a lot, a lot of bucks that trip too, just moving around where we thought they should be and picking routes and keeping the wind right and just slowly moving through areas and glassing and I don't know how many how many opportunities I screwed up on that trip, but you learn from that too, right? Just how the deer might be reacting or how you should react, maybe make a move a a little bit quicker, a little bit, have a little bit more patience, just kind of learning the feel for, for that type of hunting. It was, it was different. It was a lot of fun. So there's always something to learn. That was a new area. We did pretty good there with it being a new area, but there was a lot to learn too. It took, Took a whole trip. I left kind of a little bit disappointed, but also had a great time. I learned, uh, I think I got a new bow after that trip too with a slider pin because you're going to get opportunities at deer that they're a little bit farther away. I had like a mid 50s pound bow and pins out to 40 yards and I you know, missed two bucks at like yardage on that trip. So learn that, just get set up for. For different kind of hunts too as far as your your equipment bunch of points i want to circle back to there learning about your your equipment in michigan typically like a long shot in michigan would be something like 
40 yards because you're generally hunting thicker areas or bedding areas or swamps or whatever. But out west, your equipment, it gives you the opportunity, the terrain does, to shoot farther if you're proficient. And I think that was definitely new to you at the time. So, again, I think you had, would you have 20, 30, 40-yard pin that year? 40-yard pin, I think. Yeah, it was my max pin. And something else, and this is, I mean, it's funny in hindsight. It's not funny at the time, but you had bought a, a used bow, I think, and it was a 60-pound max draw, and I think you just assumed it was on the max draw. But after that trip, I, did you get a draw scale after that or when you bought the new bow and you found out your bow that trip was only like 53 pounds or something? Yeah, it was when I bought the new bow. Then I started buying archery tools and a uh, scale, and yeah, then I then I tested that other one out. Holy shit, that isn't what I thought it was. So that was an eye opener there too get a little bit more intimate with your equipment and learn what what you're actually shooting and especially if you're going to be shooting at distances you're gonna you're gonna want to be pulling a little bit more than that so that was that was another eye opener there's always something right yeah it's changed how you hunt because you're one of the more prepared people i know now like you said you have an extra release on every trip you've got an extra bow you've got extra critical parts you've got a toolbox you're just way more prepared and I think it's easy to hear about stories like this and say oh yeah I should do that or whatever but when it happens to you that stuff kind of stings and it makes a guy get way more prepared so I guess learn from our mistakes and and try to be as prepared as you can when you leave on these trips yeah absolutely you know it even goes to uh you know like broadheads I guess I'm thinking about now too after you're saying learn learn from your mistakes uh putting bad bad hits on beer and then setting yourself up to to maybe uh, well what went wrong there what would have made it better and then i I know that that's happened to me and well i'm gonna switch to to this and then see how that performs and then so i've i've ended up with a with a two blade set up and that just has seemed to to work for me but it's almost trial and error and learn from your mistakes and learn what works for you and what's going to give you the better chance to succeed doing this kind of stuff yeah, and another thing from the South Dakota trip, you touched on it, but I think that was about the time we really started kind of opening up our mindset to alternative tactics, and by that I mean not being married to a tree. So well, I want to back up a little further. You said oh, I had shot a buck before I even got there. So compared to Ohio, where we just cyber scouted, showed up, and then walked directly to cyber scouted spots, we didn't do any driving around, we didn't do any glassing, we didn't really check for crops. I was able to get to South Dakota a day earlier than Joel that year. And my plan the first day was since Joel wasn't there was to drive around and check out crops and see if I could find pockets of does. Cause this, this was a mid November rut hunt. So we wanted to find some does and I don't know, several hours into driving around that first day, it was getting towards dark. I saw two nice mule deer bucks right on the edge of public and I was maybe an hour left. So I grabbed my bow jumped out and they were parallel on a fence just off the public. So I was like, oh, I'll get back here a ways, check it out. And maybe I'll run into one well, on the way. I jumped up a nice white tail buck. Pretty sure it's the buck that I shot the next day. But the reason I'm bringing that story up is if it was 2013, six years earlier, I wouldn't have been driving around. I would have been real excited to just get out and hunt. And that day in South Dakota, that spot where I saw those two mule deer, sixth, seventh, eighth spot I had checked out that day and hadn't seen a deer yet. And how many of those spots would I have sat in 2013? I might have never even got to this spot. So the importance of driving around or getting boots on the ground, getting out, doing some glassing, hard to overstate, especially during the rut. You need to find the deer before you can hunt them. I think it's super important. Yeah, absolutely. That, that's part of our, our prescription here that, that we're doing now. Even this year, when we went to Kansas, I don't think we could ever imagine doing that when we when we first started taking trips and, and stuff was, sacrificing time away from sitting in a tree stand would we spend our first two full days there this year we didn't even hunt we were just all glass and looking at areas you know checking areas that we'd we'd hunted before that had been good looking for uh you know where they had the cattle and looking at the crop rotation and then maybe walking in some pieces and looking for tracks and stuff like that but i mean we we spent Two full days, which that's a, g a good percentage of your time if you're taking a 10-day trip, not even hunting, we're just scouting. So, 
yeah, I don't, I don't think you can understate the importance of that. Then the other thing I was bringing up on the South Dakota story there is, so that night I stayed in the hotel or wherever I was, wherever we were staying that year. Yeah, we stayed in a hotel that year. And the next morning I told Joel that evening, I'm like, oh, I'm going to go back in there. I saw those two mule deer bucks, which were both nice. And I saw that nice whitetail buck. No, there's deer in the area. I'm going to get back in there and, and learn the area a little more. And I remember vividly, it was freezing that morning. It was like two degrees or five degrees, something super cold. And I knew I was going to get cold sitting in the tree stand, and it was also the first day, and I just wanted to cover more ground. So I decided to still hunt. And a few years earlier, going back to Ohio, I would have never sat on the ground or, or had that kind of approach with a bow. So I just started working through this area real slow and ended up blind grunting and, and grunted that buck in. A lot of luck there. But the fact that I was uh, being quiet enough to get that close and that I was on the ground because the area I shot the buck, there was no tree stand trees for i don't know 100 200 yards so don't be afraid to to do some more it's not unconventional these days but i'd still think hunting off the ground is less popular and i did that in iowa a lot too been getting on a tangent here but a lot of the areas that i ran into bucks in iowa were like pine plantations or crp where there wasn't good tree stand trees but but the deer are still in there so having that open mindset and that bigger toolbox can up your chances of success on public land especially oh sure yeah like well know know your time of the year too right like know when you're you need to be trying stuff like that probably increase your odds if you're doing it around the time of the rut moving around cruising around like i used those tactics last year in michigan and um where years ago i'd be glued to a stand in michigan and i'd seen a bunch of bunch of bucks on their feet and the rust been a hot door around there was just I got out of the stand and just started moving around trying to glass them and spot them and see where they're at and move around and crawling in the grass and grunting and stuff after I'd seen them I ended up shooting a buck like that he, he came into five yards and killed them and you can you can kill deer in a, a variety of different ways like you said more tools in the toolbox and get some confidence using those tools and you're going to eventually be, be more deadly. I think I want to talk quick about the terrain itself, because I know the area that you're referring to, that's got more CRP type ground. The area in South Dakota was more CRP. I feel like out West, especially where there's a lot of more open flat terrain that doesn't necessarily have tall grass. The one, the deer seem to gravitate towards the CRP stuff more during the rut because they like security cover. All deer like security cover. And two, as a ground hunter, uh, it's tough because it, it can make shooting tougher. But the deer have to get closer to check out calling, you know, grunting or rattling or whatever. So I feel like those are the types of terrains where that stuff really excels. I think so, too, because you can get yourself hidden in that field and they're going to I think that's where they want to push does into also to breed them. So if another buck's coming around that area too, they're going to, they're going to want to come check it out. And I think a decoy even enhances that, but we've had good luck just crawling around. I mean, that wasn't the first one that, <clears throat> that I've had come in like point blank that time of the year in CRP like that, just get on my hands and knees and not pop above the grass and make noise crawling sounds like you got four legs too i think when you're crawling crawling through the grass but you know you've got to have eyes on them i think and get in there get in their bubble and grunt at them and stuff and they'd come running right in it's crazy when it works it works really well it seems like and obviously the rut's one of those times it works really well but pretty interesting what you said about those types of thicker trains i never really thought about that before if another buck hears a, a human grunting in there uh, simulating a buck of course uh, it makes sense that's where a buck would be in the thick stuff possibly tending a doe as opposed to one grunting in a tree or grunting in an oak flat i've had it happen i'm sure you've had it happen i'm sure tons of people listening have had it happen where you're not in a thick area and you grunt and you see a deer and it comes in but then it holds up at 60 yards or 80 yards and it looks around and you don't have a decoy out and it doesn't see anything well then it starts circling downwind and it either spooks or it loses interest because you need that heavy cover and or a visual, I think, to pull it off in bow range a lot of the times. I think so, too. I think so, too. But we've had good luck, too, uh, with, with a decoy, not in 
tall grass, but like you said, either or, give them a visual or be hidden. Thinking back to South Dakota, we we had that buck with the decoy come running in 200 plus yards and on a freaking beeline come right into us too. Yeah, they can be deadly for sure when that type of train, if you see one on the edge of on the edge of the thick cover or whatever, and you don't have any other option, the decoy there is great. I, I like that better than rattling or anything else as far as getting them to commit. Yeah, I know you've had good luck with it too. Yeah, they need to be in the right mood. and like It takes the right deer and the right time of year, but like I said, when it works, it works real good. It's, nothing's foolproof, though. That's why it's hunting. Yeah. I want to take a quick break to mention huntingbeastgear.com. Co-founded by the big buck serial killer himself, Dan Infault, Hunting Beast Gear features state-of-the-art manufacturing techniques, the highest quality materials, and innovative designs that have been engineered, field-tested, and refined to perfection by a group of the best mobile hunters on the planet. www.huntingbeastgear.com delivers cutting-edge products, including Beast Gear climbing sticks with weight reduction holes designed to deliver incredible durability in a lightweight climbing stick. Beast Gear climbing sticks also feature non-staggered, inline stacking, and double steps, all in a 2.2-pound package, including the fastening strap. HuntingBeastGear.com has also released the game-changing Beast Gear Hang-On Tree Stand. Designed to be the ultimate hang-on tree stand solution with four years of prototyping, testing, and refinement, the Beast Gear Stand features a 16-inch wide by 29-inch long platform. The stand comes in at an incredible 6.8 pounds, and it does all that without compromising strength or durability. The Beast Gear Stand is finished with a long-lasting anodized coating and features grade 8 hardware, high-quality Deller & Washers, Beast Buttons, and Adjustment Knobs. For more details and a place in order today, head on over to www.huntingbeastgear.com. Now, back to the podcast. So, all right, we talked about kind of early, the early trip in Ohio, kind of mid for us, 2019. That's been, oh, three or four seasons ago now. I guess four if you count the 2022 season because it's after the 2022 season. So this year you drew a Montana tag, which is good for archery or rifle. And you also drew a Kansas tag. I did too. And we knew we were going to Kansas during the rut. So you decided to come to Montana early season for an archery hunt. And that was a little bit different for you as well. First time, I think ever, right? For a September hunt? First time, yep. Yeah. So talk to me about what your expectations were coming out and how the trip panned out. Well, after seeing what you were doing out there in Montana early season, my expectations were to shoot a buck, right? Like, why? <laughs> <laughs> you had good good success early season, but um, joking aside, I I thought we'd probably get into some bucks. I thought maybe it'd be more of a grind than what it turned out to be. But I knew I knew we'd probably have some some success at least getting getting on deer. That kind of going back to my uh, comment about networking a, a little bit at that at that point, like. You'd already been out there. I had never been to Montana in my life, but I knew we were going to go to an area that was going to be pretty good based on you had, you had been out there and already put eyes on it and hunted it. So my expectations were to at least get get an opportunity. So I went into it hopeful, but I you know I thought like any other trip that we'd been on, with the exception of when when we were in South Dakota and you killed one before I even got there. That we we grinded out a little bit, and we knew it was going to be hot. It was over over 100 degrees plus um, when when we were there hunting. So yeah, I was hoping you'd bring that up. The forecast for the opening week of Montana this year for archery, which always starts the first Saturday in September. That was September 3rd this year. Was absolutely abysmal. I think it was what 99 degrees the first day and like 101 the second day. Yeah. Well, the other way around, it was 101 the first day. Okay. It was our first day of hunting was, was 101. Yeah. And uh, anyway, I'll talk about kind of what, what led up to that a little bit. So you, you had hunted there. You'd had success there in that area. Um, we had an area identified that you'd already been into and had success and farther back in that property, but we needed a, a certain wind to hunt it. And we were looking at that and, looking at our pins and stuff uh, the night before opening day and going back into that, that better area, we're going to get back in there and pick it apart, but the wind wasn't going to work and looking at maps and just decided to kind of go into, uh, go into that, that area where, where you had seen the, that mule deer run into earlier in the, in the summer and just thought, well, 
maybe you see something, maybe get eyes on something because you could see a little bit, little ways in there and end up getting lucky there. But feel free to cut, cut this out, Jeremy. But um, you had identified, it, knowing that it was a, a drier summer, extremely dry, and where where the mule deer would typically be would would have been uh, more up up in the uh, hills or terrain or would you know however you want to call it and since it was so dry they were down closer to water and that was kind of where we were going to key in on so we maybe thought that they'd, they'd be in there and that that's what was going on there was quite a quite a bit of mule deer down in there so went in there and set up and didn't get too tight to bedding and glanced the deer saw the deer stand up quite a ways away and decided it was definitely a shooter and luck have it 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 come in and end up getting a shot at it but yeah I mean we we kind of we had a game plan though and as far as the wind and what we thought the deer would be doing and I didn't necessarily think that that would would be the spot where where it was going to happen or as early as it happened but that's that's uh that's what ended up happening there yeah so don't leave me hanging your first evening you glassed up this deer and it came in you shot at it and then what happened the deer come in I shot at it you want the whole story yeah I mean what happened people are probably wondering (laughs) Did you hit it? Did you miss? Oh, no. So I hit it. Um, I ended up spining it and uh, had to do a follow-up shot. So they're, they're, not, all, they're not all pretty. That's, that's for sure. No, but a couple of points, in, and I wanted to bring these up specifically about Montana and or, or any western state in this year specifically. So first one's the weather. The temperatures were just ungodly, for even for Montana. Like, it gets warm here a lot, especially in – july and august even into september but i would say the typical average temperature for that time of year opening day is like daytime high 70 maybe 80 degrees so 100 degrees was unseasonably warm but the year before in the same general area i had shot that real nice whitetail buck and it was like 86 or 87 degrees that day so i kept telling you and boyd don't get discouraged because the deer are that early in the year early september they're still moving the days are way longer you know, the first part of September than they are the first part of October. So you got more chance for daylight movement than you do say on a Michigan opener. But I was, I was a little nervous because I'd never hunted temperatures that hot. I didn't know what kind of deer movement we were going to see, but how early did, did you glass that buck? Like before dark, how hour, hour and a half, two hours. It was pretty early, wasn't it? It was early. I watched the deer for, for a good half hour too. So I don't remember the exact time I shot the buck, but there was considerable amount of daylight left to the point where, where I glassed them. I watched them stand up. It took them probably a half hour to come in and then to go back to, I'm glad I, I had a properly set up bow. Cause again, it's, it's open. You're not relying on funnels really to bring them right tight by uh, it was a 50 yard shot. So I did, I did find them. Um, like I said, but I had, I had a good bow to get myself in the, in the ballpark there, but, I let them sit for a little bit because they dropped, and by then I had time to shoot them again, finish them off, walked up to the road and called you guys, and geez, there was probably a good two hours of daylight left, I would think. And they were up and moving early, and uh, and it was that hot. Yeah, so don't discount the hot temperatures early season. The other thing I'm going to say is you talked about water. So the last two or three years, Montana has been exceptionally dry like historically dry. So the first year I moved here and I came out in 2017 to hunt with friends too. That was during rifle season, but I had seen pictures from the summer and it just looks like two different landscapes. It was so green in 2017. That was a pretty good moisture year compared to these last two years where like everything is dead everywhere. And so it's important to get along ponds, creeks, some of these water systems, find isolated water holes that the cattle, you know, that ranchers have for, cattle on blm lands and stuff and those really make a difference and a lot of people they talk about hunting water like in michigan by comparison i mean michigan's an oasis so i I don't think you can really maybe you can i haven't seen a situation personally where you could effectively hunt water in michigan and even kansas it was funny going back there this year the amount of water compared to a lot of these areas in montana like Montana is just so much drier than Kansas even, which I think Kansas is a dry place. So mm-hmm. early season, water is just a huge, 
huge deal out here if it continues. And I would say not just Montana, but, you know, the Dakotas possibly. I know Wyoming's had terrible drought too. Utah, any of these western states, if you're playing an early season hunt, it's hard to overstate the importance of water. Right. And then, well, that was a that was something that you had keyed in on to where if, uh, let's, let's say I was going to Montana, I didn't know you, I wanted to hunt mule deer. I'd probably be looking in the, in the train, you know, <laughs> better like typical mule deer train. And that was right across the street more than that. But I mean, you know, close, close. They had their, they had their choice that they wanted to be up in, in some good, good terrain type stuff that you typically think mule deers would be in. And they weren't, they were, they were in more like whitetail habitat. So like you said, that's something that, that we, we know now and can key in on, on, on other areas too, that, that trend would probably, probably be likely too. Yeah. It's funny how sometimes you assume certain things and I'm not saying you specifically, you as in hunters in general, we, we assume certain things. When we went to South Dakota the first year, we were, I think, completely 180 off on where we expected deer to be and, and the movement. So we maybe expected them to be more lower and, and they were higher than we expected because we hunted areas with some mm-hmm. terrain and we learned quick. So it's like, don't rely on whatever your assumption is going in. Let the animals and the terrain tell you what's going on. And that, I think, just circling way back to when we first started hunting, I think that's a mistake both of us made too was – Oh, you read this and that's, that's how it is. Right. And you go out there and that's how it is. Even when you're seeing evidence to the contrary, sometimes you say, Oh yeah, well, I read this. That's how it is. It's like, nah, let that specific environment because Michigan's different than uh, Montana and, and Utah is different than Ohio. So there's a lot of similarities in deer behavior across regions, but there's also definitely differences that are dictated by terrain. So just let the environment tell you what, what to do or what to believe. Yeah, exactly. And don't even just to take it one step further. If you've had success in a certain spot, don't, don't let that dictate that that's going to be good again, just because, because it might, it might not for, for various reasons, whether that might be crusher, crop rotation, cattle, whatever. Don't get glued on, on anything really, unless the conditions are exactly, exactly the same. Yeah, so I'm going to put you on the spot here. I know you said don't put you on the spot, but... Yeah, don't do that. <laughs> if you had to look back now, and we, we talked through a lot of the mistakes that we made and some of the things that we do, like our program or prescription, you call it now, what do you think are, say, two, three, four things, whether it's gear, whether it's preparation, hunting the train, whatever, what do you think, if you had to dis- distill it down to a few key pieces of information, what's super important to you now as far as factors that contribute to success? Super important to me current day that's contributing to success is one, getting in areas that is going to have a deer that, that I want to shoot. That's one. So that's maybe drawing tags in those areas or if it's local, make sure I'm hunting in areas that have the deer and the deer are there at the time I'm, I'm wanting to hunt them. Two, don't, don't get just glued to spots. Don't spread yourself too thin. So those are kind of polar opposites. But uh, as far as like the prescription, like you were just talking, when we're going out of state, we're not jumping right in in tree stands and in hunting necessarily right away. We're spending some considerable time scouting, making sure we're we're finding the deer to make make our sit higher percentage in the gear. You know, just making sure you're having the right gear that's gonna be applicable to, to, to whatever you're doing. Like, like we were talking about the bows and, uh, that bow that we were talking about that I had, that was 50 some pounds draw. Um, I had a 40 yard pin that's perfectly fine for Michigan. Probably was never going to hamper me here, but that's really not cutting the mustard. If you're going out of state and like, you know, I, I had a 50 yard shot at the mule deer, you know, just making sure you got gear that's going to, benefit you for wherever you're at i mean even and we're still learning right like even this year it was an eye opener thought i had good enough gear to keep me warm in the stand but i was pretty darn cold and in kansas so thank god it didn't take me too long because i would have had to go to the store and buy something to keep me a little bit warmer you know just make sure you have the right gear for wherever you're going um i knew it was going to be super hot in montana so 
I bought hot weather moisture wicking type gear to make that a little bit more tolerable. Something like 15 degrees or less. I, I need to invest in some pack boots and something to keep my head and neck warm. You know, you're always learning, but just always make sure you got the right stuff to keep you comfortable and on stand and able to shoot your, the animals that you're after. Just make sure you got the gear that's applicable to you, whatever it is that you're doing. I don't think uh, getting getting into the weeds and being a total gear nut is is necessary, but just make sure you have the right stuff or whatever it is that you're doing. But that's it. Just hunt in areas that you know the deer are at. So spend the time to find them. That's the major takeaway. And don't start hunting and wasting your time on stand until you know where, where your targets are at. Yeah, it seems so simple and so obvious, but uh, we were certainly guilty of not doing that. And I know a lot of people to this day that don't take uh, hunting seriously maybe as we do friends family back home that are still doing the same thing so it's interesting and you know we didn't talk about Kansas this year so we did talk about Montana you were on stand for two hours and you shot what I believe is your number one or number two deer and then we went to Kansas this year during the rut and you you did it again so (laughs) tell me about that story too yeah I I think I think I was on stand for two hours there too yeah, first morning we really hunted. I guess we were there for a day and a half doing, like you said, the scouting and driving around, but our first committed tree stand hunt, I guess start from there. Yeah, so that hunt, though, that it wasn't just like, oh, two-hour hunt and we're done. We had a lot of time into that, right? Like, we'd been to Kansas. Well, that was our fifth time going to Kansas, counting spring scouting trips, drawing tags and hunting trips. We had been there uh, – considerable amount of time and we'd been perceptive of what what was going on there and how the deer were using terrain and what pieces we thought would be good and we didn't draw a Kansas tag last year but we went in the spring and we scouted and we picked out a handful of new spots that that we thought would be good and this was one of them and we're using looking at the terrain, how the deer are using the terrain and what, what the deer are doing and deciding what we, what we thought was, was going to be good or higher, higher ad spots. The spot that I sat and killed the buck, that was one of, one of those spots that we picked out the previous spring when we were there, but we probably wouldn't have picked a spot like that without being there in hunting two years before that. And we'd been there even a spring before that too and looking at how these deer were using stuff. It was probably a spot that we would disregard, never even look at. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And again, we didn't even hang our hats on that was going to be a good spot. Oh, we're going to go hunt there. Uh, we had got there, and we were we were there for a couple of days, and that was one of the spots that that we decided were going to be good based on our, our scouting and what was going on that season and that day, that week. There was no cattle on that property. There was tracks. We I'd walked up in that piece before we even set a stand in there. So it was previous years of hunting and scouting and knowing what the deer are doing. Spring scouting the year before, in season scouting, and then throwing a stand up, and that's what got the deer killed. Yeah, and I just wanted you to tell that story. So, twenty twenty two and. Sure, maybe it's obviously somewhat good luck, but you shot a deer on your first sit in two hours in Montana and on your first real sit in Kansas within two hours. And it's just, that's kind of the whole reason I wanted to do this episode because, you know, we've been hunting together for, like I said, almost 10 years now from our abysmal first trip or two out of state where We thought we knew what we were doing, where we relied solely on cyber scouting. We didn't put those boots on the ground. We didn't take trips outside of the season. We weren't prepared from a gear front to how that's evolved over 10 years with South Dakota being a pretty good midpoint where we started having some success and there are a lot more encounters opening up the technique box a little more, being more open-minded to getting to Montana and Kansas this year where one, the experience, right? We've, we've obviously become better hunters over 10 years, but I think, I think we work in smarter ways, harder than ever at it. If that makes sense. I would agree. It took a lot of time to, to realize how to, how to work in the smarter ways. We had to put our time in and be 
be perceptive and be able to learn too. My message for guys that are listening is if you're thinking about making your first out of state trip, or maybe you just made one, or maybe you've got two and you're having limited success. We did two <laughs> and it's taken literally a decade of reading the forums, watching videos, doing it, taking extra trips when we could to scout, tweaking our gear, all that stuff. Like it's kind of a, just a continual evolution and going back to what Dan says about confidence. Like, I don't know about you, but every time I go somewhere now, I'm confident I'm going to, I'm going to have a chance, maybe not day one, but I'm going to have a chance at some point in that trip because we put in the work and the learning. And I definitely did not feel like that 10 years ago. So stick with it for the long haul is my message, I guess. I think so too. I agree. Yeah. We've been plugging away at it for some time now, but after a while, after you learn what you need to do and see some trends. And like you said, I think, I think after a while, you're going to at least be able to put yourself in a position where you're going to get good opportunities. Awesome. Well, I think that's all the questions I had for today. I always like to turn it over to the guest at the end of the podcast. We talked about a lot of the stuff that worked for us, but any closing words of wisdom you might have for anyone listening, Joel? Yeah, um, I think I think a lot of people want to just jump because hunting is is really the uh, hyped up these days, and there's a lot of stuff out there about it, and people think that they can just jump right in and kill big bucks, and and maybe there is enough information out there where they can they can maybe get, get onto some bucks that are, that are decent off the bat. Even it does, it does take time and no replacement for boots on the ground. But I, I think if people are just getting into it, there's a lot to be said for, for killing deer and getting proficient at that and, and learning what, what happens, you know, learning different, what different shots do and learning to be a better tracker. And cause that's, that's all playing into your success at, and harvesting deer too. So if you got a big buck coming in and you're not experienced at, you know, different shot angles and how those are going to kill the deer or not kill the deer or uh, what to expect on the track after, because it's not all picture perfect all the time. So gaining that experience and putting that into uh, when you're, when you're, when you're hunting better deer and, I feel like that's going to up your success rate too. Just being a proficient killer tracker, you need that experience and that jump jump off point before you're being really proficient. So I would say just get proficient at killing deer and tracking and what they're, what they're telling you after, after the hit too, I think is super important. No, that's a great point. Everybody these days, especially in the age of instant gratification and social media, everybody wants to be a big buck killer from day one heck even 10 years or 15 years ago when i started taking archery a lot more seriously i definitely wanted to be one too but shauna my girlfriend her dad who is a kind of my bow hunting mentor told me he's like you just got to shoot some deer and that's the message i'm hearing from you and it's not wrong so everybody's got to crawl before they can walk and walk before they can run and there's no shame in that right i've shot plenty of smaller deer uh i know you have too Nothing wrong with yeah. that. And and it matters where you hunt too, right? Like you're not going to have the same opportunities in Florida that you do in a Kansas or an Iowa or whatever. So the playing field isn't equal, but you got to start somewhere. And I always say you don't want to figure it out on a booner. You want, you want to have it figured out by then. I think that was my point. Yeah. That's a, that's a great message is. Sure. You could have a booner come walking in broadside 10 yards and you double along him and he falls right over in sight. You could have that happen or. You could have them come in, you know, hard quarter and two and have confidence that I know where to put this arrow. Or you could shit all over yourself and I don't know what, you know. So, yeah, there's uh, something to be said for just gain, gaining some experience and being uh, being prepared for the big game when, when it does arise. Yeah, agreed, 100%. Well, Joel, I want to thank you for your time, for coming on today. Uh, we talk all the time, but pleasure to get you on here. been meaning to do it for a while, and, and we've both got time now. So that's awesome, and congrats again on an awesome 2022 season. Thanks, Jeremy. All right, buddy. We'll catch you later. Talk to you.